Everything here is cooked. Water and fire in clay pots await the palate and the soul of the whole group. The Thoe love family meals and the after-dinner relaxation. This is not going to be a conventional film, an anthropological study in which gestures and actions are imitated. No, it's merely the results of two months of living together among human beings who know nothing of our world, of the other side of the shore, with no intentions of translating anything, but just enjoying their presence and sharing our passion for life, the same passion that they have felt for thousands of years in this unknown and hidden Amazon. We're talking about a community of barely 200 people according to our data, but a community capable of existing without harming nature, something that our society has forgotten. That fascinates us and makes them enviable. The Thoe have no need for us. They're happy, unhappy, depending on the day and the trials of each individual. They're humanly contradictory, and like other villages of the Amazon, have had to deal with accusations such as cannibalism, stemming from images like this one, in which an explorer or a missionary naively chose to see human flesh instead of monkey meat. Their everyday problems, like our own, have much to do with the kind of life they lead. Boy is hurt and angry today. Hunting is not an easy task. The jungle always takes its toll. He's returned to his home full of ticks, and his family hurries to attend him. A few of his children, and Toton and Yirosi, his wives, attack the four cardinal points of his well-formed anatomy. They love him, and they don't want him to suffer. Ouch, that hurts. These mites don't respect anything. As faithful nomads, the Thoe appreciate a home when the seasons permit them to create one. They construct their tapich, light but safe and comfortable, with wood and palm leaves. Various people with no strict family ties will live under this new roof. This house is being built by this elderly woman and her young husband, among others, but it will be ready this very afternoon to give shelter to friends and family members. The open architecture guarantees that no one will remain without a roof to protect them from the blistering sun. When did the first Thoe arrive here? How did they learn to interpret the landscape and make it their own? We'll never know nor will they. They live in Eden, surrounded by untouched nature, and their beliefs are also inspired by Mother Earth. They don't have a fixed God, identified and idolized, but they do have animals and plants that are important to their spiritual lives. From the very small to the very big, all the actors of this great carnival of colors and forms are appreciated by these people who live in the heart of their mother jungle. Like all people, they also fear their demons. For example, the two-headed onsa, an abominable jaguar that smells awful and which they fear. When they smell its presence, they stop passing through the area for several months. In spite of surviving as hunters, death is not their only means of communication with the other inhabitants of the jungle. They hunt where and when the natural cycles allow them to do so, and they respect the breeding periods of their game, turning them into sacred periods when hunting is not permitted. Natural resources are limited, 
and they're aware of that. They never settle near rivers, whose banks are inhabited by supernatural beings such as this freshwater crab, which they call Wahau. It's the ruler of the subaquatic world, and they believe that with its powerful claws, it can destroy the head of any human being who dares to invade its domains. From our point of view, it looks delicious. It could be an exquisite dish, but Athoe would never dare to eat it. A festive air takes over the calendar every now and then. The excuses are many, but just one is truly important, thanking life for so much happiness. With the fruit of the palm tree, acai and sapuke, a cake is made that everyone wants to get their hands on. Acai, and not petroleum, is the black gold in the Amazon. Now it's eaten like a homemade cake, using the nut of the sapuke for starch, another gem from this enormous fruit shop in which they live. Later, grandmothers, mothers and granddaughters will use the juice left over from this refined sweet to prepare bidoua, a beverage reserved for special days and that will serve its purpose after having fermented for several hours. The party begins at dusk, and children and adults begin to dance in honor of the dead and of the earth that shelters them. It's the first time we see them holding casetes, rudimentary sticks that are used as deadly weapons in other parts of Brazil. These enormous men shouldn't frighten us. They're just sizing each other up. It's the men that make the ground tremble this afternoon, singing their yiyet, and the women that watch them, waiting to participate with their magic potions. There are no hallucinogenic drugs here. The Thoe do not frivolously drug themselves as do millions of people in our world. They get their euphoria simply from life, pure life injected into their veins. They drink Pidua, and they diligently purge themselves without losing control. It's convenient to cleanse the body on the inside every once in a while, and this beverage is extremely efficient. They don't vomit because they're drunk, they do so because they are purifying themselves. The women and children will also do it, but apart from this celebration. Men sana in corpore sano, a rule that is strictly followed and one that will permit them to sing their chants throughout the night until dawn. <laughs> the name Thoe means we the Puturu tribe, the group of human beings who pierce their lower lips with an enormous wooden cylinder taken from the Puturu tree. They change this cylinder every 15 days, and they find them so attractive that they don't recognize themselves without this piece of wood decorating their face. When they're children, after all their baby teeth have fallen, their parents turn them into thoe decorating their children with what is the symbol of the tribe. At first they use small sticks and later larger ones, decorating their faces for the rest of their lives. The women as well as the men use the puturu, and they consider white men rather ugly without these facial decorations. They take exquisite care of this jewelry. It's an essential part of their beauty. And they wash it as often as they can, polishing it with sand from the river.